Leaders cannot exist without followers, but followers cannot be coerced. A good boss must be a good leader. If not, followers will desert or mutiny and find a new leader. This is the eternal dynamic between a leader versus a boss and leaders versus followers. Traditionally, the mark of a strong tech company has been its innovation first and company culture second. However, when it comes to creating a startup society, you have to start with the community culture first and then cultural innovation. Cultural innovation means probing the past and learning from it. In this episode of the Network State podcast, we uncover how human history is the basis for understanding the way we interact with each other. With a strong insight into the history that shaped us, we highlight what rules have guided us to where we are today. As we dive deeper into how to build a new society, we retrace the steps of how countries were built in the first place. And finally, from the point of view of an entrepreneur, we analyze how much easier it is to use the iPhone, one of the most advanced handheld devices on the market, versus being the founder of the company that makes iPhones, Apple Inc., one of the most successful companies of all time. everyone welcome to another episode of the network state podcast i'm your ooh, host ooh. adrian harrison with rafael benrose your other host welcome welcome all right today we are going to be covering history as trajectory this is chapter two of the network state book um just going to share my screen here so you can all see what i'm talking about all right so uh, so much to cover in this chapter. Uh, Raphael, I know, also has lots of notes. Um, but basically, this chapter is all about why is history even important in the context of making a network state? Why does it matter? Um, and why should we care? Um, Raph, do you want to start with some of your initial thoughts as well? Yeah, I mean, I think the the subject here is he, he brings I, what's interesting i guess here is he he brings over a lot of different arguments I, practical arguments actually um as to why history is important and um that you basically the the argument he makes at least in the first half of this chapter is we should be looking at history regardless of what you're doing because History is an instrument, obviously, to understand things and, and how we build understanding as well. And I think that's what comes across from the chapter. And he just uh, approaches it from different angles. The interesting, the interesting thing for us is to see, you know, how much of each of these different angles are actually contributing to what the network state is supposed to look like, um, if they're valid. And, and hopefully, yeah, we can break down some of the assumptions that are in there. But uh, as usual, the metaphors are really strong. And and history is one of my favorite subjects. So yeah, we should be should be having some fun. Awesome. Okay, so the first thing I want to start with here um, is this paragraph right here. So the short version is that if a tech company is about technological innovation first and company culture second, a startup society is the reverse. It's about community culture first and technological innovation second. And while innovating on technology means forecasting the future, Innovating on culture means probing the past. Uh, and so what I thought was really interesting about this is uh, a lot of people, when they hear about the network state, are asking like, well, why does it have to be a state? And you know, why isn't it just a startup? Why isn't it just a DAO? Why isn't it just an organization? Those are and, valid questions. And there are valid questions, right? Um, but I think what Balaji has talked about time and time again is there are very clear distinctions between the different levels of what this can be. So starting with a startup society, which uh, is the like base level, which itself is different from a web two traditional startup, or what he's calling here, right? Um, uh, this is, I think, it's just a normal startup, um, as opposed to a startup society. And then level two would be uh, a network union, which is essentially just like uh, more people working on something. Um, and it's bigger than the startup society, than a network archipelago, which is where you actually have pieces of land in the real world as well. And then the last level, a network state, which is where you have that diplomatic recognition piece. Um, mm -hmm. So I mean, just on that, those are those are his levels, right? This is how he yes. breaks down the development of of um, 
like basically the development of labels and uh, how much he's applying his concept, like the concept is being actually filled in. Yes, um, exactly. Um, and so this is this is a good answer to that initial question about what's the difference between a startup and a startup society, and it's this, right? It's that, um, it's that spectrum, right? And you know, so many companies today, especially the large tech companies that we've seen time and time again, Facebook, Twitter, um, et cetera, are focusing on that technological innovation first. Um, and so what I think is important in this startup society is focusing on that culture because if the culture is the main driving force, and so we can think of companies like SpaceX, like Tesla, um, uh, pretty much all of Elon's companies, right? Uh, where he prioritizes, we're here to accomplish a mission. Uh, we will try to make it as you know profitable as possible and whatever, but the goal of this company is to accomplish a mission. Um, that is the main differentiator. And so just to illustrate that point a little bit more, right? SpaceX is, we want to make humans multiplanetary. Tesla is, we want to accelerate the advent of sustainable energy, right? Um, and they're both accomplishing that and it attracts, and this is why it's so important, it attracts people that care more about accomplishing the mission than maximizing their own individual profit. Um, and that's why they have a massive edge over a company like Facebook um, or Twitter, where you know now even with Twitter, we can talk about it, right? The mission of Twitter in the past was to maximize profit as a social network. Now that Elon has acquired it, the mission is to maximize and kind of be an absolutist around freedom of speech, right? And that's why like he fired so many people and you know, so many of the things in the company are changing. So this is why this point is so important and what differentiates between startups and startup societies. Anything just, else you want to say on that? Just on that point. Or? Yeah. Yeah, just on that point. Um, it's funny because the book, this chapter actually uses SpaceX, as you can see like on that screen, yeah. as the example for a tech company, which I guess is the reverse argument that we're kind of making, except they are a, they are a mission driven tech company, but their limitation is, I mean, I guess it's like the innovation, technological innovation first um, is, is a mission driven um, company. But uh, at the end of the day, a company is still expected to make money. I don't know, you know, like how much of that is overlapping, you know, and should uh, there are technological, I guess, tech companies who uh, maybe do care more about profit. Um, mm -hmm. is, does that make it so far removed, or is there a state? Is there a point where, like, a network stage, you know, should also be looking at the the money that it makes, and and actually, is that not like a third tier in the hierarchy? So basically, absolutely, absolutely. And tech, this is like you have culture, you have money. I mean, those three things go together because you wouldn't be able to finance tech without money. <laughs> Exactly. So it's a prerequisite for the numbers to work. The numbers have to work no matter what. Um, however, the way Bology describes the difference, and um, I think this also makes a lot of sense, is when you have a DAO and you put out a tweet, uh, maybe you know some small percentage of the DAO members like the tweet, retweet, whatever. What he's talking about when, uh, and we, if we go back to the definition of what is a uh, network state to, to, to start off with, so uh, here, let's go check that out um, in the preamble is that they have aligned action, I believe is the word that he uses, or co a collective aligned action, something along those lines, which means when we put out a tweet, there are every single member who likes that tweet and retweets that tweet, right? So he's kind of just, he's basically illustrating the point. Um, it's a more powerful uh, version of people taking collective action as one. Um, and so it magnifies the effects of whatever actions you take because now it's like not just you as an individual, it's you and every single member of this startup society or every single member of this network state doing the same thing. Um, and so here we go, we can see, uh, right, highly aligned online community. That's what he's talking about there uh, with the capacity for collective actions, right? Or action. That is the, the important piece or the, or the differentiator. And so we can see how that becomes very powerful when it's like, you know, when it's liking a tweet, okay, whatever, big deal. When it's every single member is gonna donate $10 towards buying this piece of land, 
now you see that that starts to have a big impact, right? Or every single member is going to, you know, protest at this square in their city at this time, that starts to have a lot of impact, right? So that highly aligned uh, collective action, I think is a, is a really important differentiator between those, those startups and uh, startup societies. I guess the premise there is that either, I mean, one side could be, I assume, is that the identity or the sense of belonging to the network state is so strong that you're like hyper motivated to uh, act in this way. Or um, the other thing is, I guess your identity is kind of, um, you, you sort of subvert your own identity for the collective. Um, so I, in a way that's, for me, that sounds like a bit of a, it's what you, you would remove your own agency basically saying, you know, like, maybe I didn't agree to this action, how, how much of that plays into that. But, but actually, because it's the collective will of the organization, then we're going to follow through on that because it broadly, you know, follows the goal, the, the path towards our, our goal as that's, a, as a nation state. So that's a great point, right? State. Like, yeah. yeah. How does it affect agency? And, you know, it's something Balaji talked about as well. And in, in terms of, um, the ways that these should be set up should be to maximize agency. However, right, that does mean each of these points that this network state wants to take, right? Let's say they put out a proposal, hey, we want to crowdfund this piece of land. Um, every single person needs to opt in, right, to that. Uh, if the majority vote happens to be yes, um, and the the collective doesn't have that highly aligned action, then, you know, it's, it's not going to be as powerful as, um, or it's not going to be more powerful than just your average startup or your average DAO. Um, yeah. So it's not, a, it's, not a, it's not a necessity, but it's definitely an important consideration to have um, because the advantage of that highly collective action in terms of how fast you can move, what you can accomplish, um, and speed, again, is such an important piece in all of this because how have startups disruptive massive players in the past time and time again is with speed. It's the only advantage that they have over these, you know, way more powerful, way better funded, way more large organizations that are kind of just slow and bureaucratic. Um, mm. If you have speed, you can disrupt. And so if these network states or these startup societies have speed, they can disrupt. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah. 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 I, I mean, I guess in that case specifically, the speed is, is enabled by the smart contract, which let's say if it reaches that voting threshold, whatever mechanism you're using, whatever standard like parameters you've put on that voting me mechanism, if it passes, it can be automatically sort of set um, into motion. Totally, As exactly. In, uh, yeah. There you go. So, um, okay, let's go on to the, the next point here. Um, let's get this out. Um, so, the next is that he's kind of talking about, you know, why why is history so important? Um, you know, what what is it what does it really matter um, that people pay attention to this stuff? And you know, to me, what was really fascinating is this passage right here. Uh, history is the closest thing we have to a physics of humanity. It furnishes many accounts of how human actors collide and interact with each other. The right course of historical study encodes in compressed form the results of innumerable social experiments. You can learn from human experience rather than rederiving re societal law from scratch. Learn some history so as not to repeat it, right? And so I think the biggest like uh, quote here is that history is the closest thing that we have to a physics of humanity, right? So just like physics are the laws of our universe and govern the way that everything is set up, um, history can be that for humanity because it's what people refer to as truth, right? Or what happened in the past um, either from number one, it sets a precedent for something. And therefore, if it has happened in the past, it can uh, happen in the future. And also, this is what happened in the past. And therefore, XYZ consequences or causes happened, right? And so that could be used to justify all kinds of other future actions, which we'll dive into a little bit more. But yeah, what did you think about that, Raph? Yeah, I saw I saw you pick that one out. Um, and uh, it's a... Uh... 
it's a weird quote for me. I, it, basically, my point is it's it's really not a, a perfect analogy. Um, and uh, I mean, I guess he qualifies it by saying history is the closest thing, as in it, he's not saying it is, you know, what physics is, because you can ignore history. <laughs> You can't really ignore physics, <laughs> you know. Like if if I jump out the window, I will fall. <laughs> right. Um, and I and I guess that's an interesting point. So so what that means for me is, you know, he he wants to associate the importance of history. You know, he wants to ma it, it makes it feel more history centric. Um, I think it makes sense that that's the first from a argument because my 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 perspective of the network state is it's it is a political manifesto that's trying to convince people. Mm -hmm. of of uh, at least exploring this idea and so the first argument um you're going to begin with history and so if you're going to begin with history history needs to matter so this is a very you're, you're going to want to come out strong with this uh, or strongly with um with this kind of message uh and by equating it to something that's as immutable if we want to use a blockchain world <laughs> word as uh, physics which you know yeah of course the analogy is that the more you dive into it the more you'll learn about these things and therefore you know the more capable we'll be uh, in terms of like shaping what goes around that and and how we how much of it we uh yeah we're we're able to harness for our own means at the end of the day if you don't care about physics um you're still going to be affected by physics whereas if you don't care about history um you know it's it's you i guess you could make a collective action which is not to care about history <laughs> and yeah, then that would and, actually be valid right i mean that i think that's the most important point right um and it actually brings us into like this next quote um that i'll share in a second but um you know you can manipulate history you can't manipulate physics uh, or rather you can't change them to your liking um and that's, I think, the most important point here, um, because history has been used as a weapon many, many times before for one's political agenda. And we know that history is written by the winners. And we'll, we'll dive into that more. But here, right, so to build a new society, it'd be helpful to have some knowledge of how countries were built in the first place, the logistics of the process. And this, again, brings us into the domain of history, right? So where are we basing how this country is going to be formed? Well, we need to know how countries were formed previously, what happened uh, when the founding fathers met, right? Why did they meet? Uh, what did they talk about? How did they decide what the constitution was gonna say? Um, why did they decide that, right? And did they study um, history before they did that to learn from the previous mistakes of when was the UK created? Why did they create it that way, right? As a kingdom or France or whatever. Um, and so these are just like really important examples um, that show for a country that's as young as the US, that if you approach it uh, from first principles and just think about what makes a good country uh, and how has this been done before, why has it been done that way, is there a better way that we can do this, um, I think is a much stronger approach that we'll have to see with these network states again and again. Um, and then you know it'll be an idea meritocracy. So whichever countries have the best values or the best mission for each individual will attract them. Um, and so you know, using the example of the U.S., why did the founding fathers make the Constitution prioritize life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness? Because those ideals can resonate with so many other people, and that's why it's attracted so much tourism, and you know why so many people wanted to develop the land here and, and live here. Um, for that quote unquote American dream. Um, and so these things matter, right? It's kind of telling the story of your country, the branding of your country, the mission, the vision, the values, um, why those matter. And there's a lot of parallels there with startups. Yeah, I mean, so much to unpack there. <laughs> yeah, we can stay um, on that for a bit. Yeah, let's, let's, let's stay here for a little while. Um, I mean, right out of the gates, uh, right out of the gates, uh, this quote is, um, conflicting for me again, uh, you know, like to build a new society using the term society is one thing. And then it's helpful to have some knowledge of how countries were built in the first place. So I don't know if he's making an equivalence between society and countries. 
because those two things are are different um and obviously so but then but then you br it's funny because you brought up the example of of the us which is both uh, which was both sort of setting itself out as a new society and a new country right but for me those two things are not equal for example france more or less the same country but very, very different societies between the first revolution the empire and then the democracy or, that it has today um and and i would say that actually you know yes all of those were france country you know geographically maybe i mean the empire changed quite a bit but what we consider mainland france probably didn't change so much or or it didn't change that much um territorially but as a society it's very different to be under an empire under a democracy or under a kingdom yeah um and so uh so so the that opens up kind of two two points because there's the history of of countries and territories and their development and there's the history of societies there's the history of states and how states are uh capable of being formed in general and that state and country and society all those are three different subjects actually and looking at um three different uh pillars of uh i guess humanity civilization the way that we sort of like understand boundaries today um if to to so if if society is not equal to country which is uh which is what i would say then definitely we should look at country versus state and and how states were even conceptualized to begin with in in ir we look at the um westphalian treaty uh in history in history also you look at that as sort of like the foundation of western uh understanding of what a state or a country i guess so, so di dive mean. into that rap like explain to the listener what is that and you know how did they come up with that well um basically it's um uh, westphalian treaty um coming after devastating war a uh, multi-decade war across europe um basically showing the f i mean it's so many factors one was religious warfare uh, uh against protestants and catholics and then another one was sort of the ending of feudalism, feudalism and the formation of sort of like kingdoms, basically, and kingdoms or religious, uh, religious kingdoms, whatever it was, just united territories that were beyond princes, basically, you no, know, and locality. And suddenly you can you can say, well, um, we the people who won that war in in the same way that we'll see again in other examples, World War One, World War Two, um, and and before, and still to this day the the nations the rulers of the regimes that won those wars uh got to redecide who sat at the table at the time and were looking for people of the same who would control and act in a way that was similar to them so that they could deal with them as equal partners because mm -hmm. if one of the issues of the 30 years war for example which uh, involved um this conflict of, of religious warfare was that you have uh, a pseudo empire of the Holy Roman Empire taking a uh, sort of seemingly controlling um, most of Central Europe all the way down from Italy all the way to uh, Denmark and going through uh, Germany. If that society or that empire was made up of multiple little states ruled by different princes or different organizations, um, and in between it, you have a kingdom like France, which is more or less being unified, and a kingdom like Sweden, which is definitely unified on some level, uh, you don't want to be dealing and negotiating with all of these little princes. You want to be dealing and negotiating with the person who's in charge of everything. Um, right. Because why? So, so I think one angle is just to say that like, there's a collective, um, again, traumatic and destructive, devastating warfare, but uh, that took that 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 had an immense impact on like the trajectory of history. <laughs> if we want to go on theme, um, but one of the results of that is we can now define a state as like this very powerful centralized um, system, and that that should be the priority for diplomacy and um, uh, economic interactions, legal interactions between uh, actors within Europe. And that understanding, that shift from little princes to one state, uh, one kingdom, one regime uh, over a large amount of territory or a large amount of uh, economic prowess or population was dramatic and, and was so formative that um, it's sort of seen as the foundation of, of what, what created a space for competition, which would then result into empires. 
um, because it gave it gave a drive for centralization without knowing it perhaps by saying by putting in the treaty that look look these are the new countries and we're the ones the ones that are kingdoms and centralized are deciding the rules you're writing a rule book which uh, supports people who centralize things out um and so uh, you, a lot of states ended up benefiting who weren't really necessarily part of that conflict for example uh, england and then the its consolidation of power as uh, the great uh, as great britain and then that you can project that power then out, obviously. Um, and uh, that when they came into contact with powers in, or, or different communities in North, Af uh, North America, Africa, Asia, you know that it was a tectonic shift, basically, at that point. Okay, so... It's a bit of a deep um, dive. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm trying to like put it all together into one sentence. So um, how would we like put a bow on that to say, essentially the ways that um, sorry, I, for, I forgot the name. What was it called again? The Westphalian Treaty? Westphalian yeah. Treaty. It's to focus on this consolidation and centralizing of power to determine whether a new country can be created and recognized as powerful. Yeah, I mean, I think maybe you could make an argument that that was the underlying... Um, that, that was sort of like the untold story that they um, built out. Again, maybe I'm playing with history too much at this point. In reality, it's just like, here's the winners deciding like who gets what. Um, but it, but the logic that was used and how they chose to represent it uh, obviously represented them, which was this model, this model, which you just described. And uh, we see that again uh, after World War I that most people learn in history class as being the reason why there is World War II. <laughs> Um, because actually those redrawing of lines weren't so successful. Again, World War II, similar issue with um, what we see then with decolonialization. And yet, and yet, each time those treaties happens, yes, they fail, and we see that the system sort of like gets broken up one way or another, either uh, divulging into warfare between those original parties or redrawing their maps in some other way. Um, but the definition of what a state is persists from, from that moment when it was codified. So there is an evolution between that first treaty of Westphalian all the way to uh, the ending of World War II. But the way that, uh, but from World War II onwards, a valid state is defined by one that was capable of like uh, participating in that treaty, just like uh, the valid kingdom that made it out of that treaty phase of, of the Westphalian treaty became sort of the standard, the archetype for a nation. And so I guess the, the bow on that is societies can evolve within those, but as long as they have a seat at the table in terms of like, what is right. a state defined, right. uh, that's where we should be looking at really interestingly. And, um, who's setting and the world order, right? And who gets to decide who's at the table in that discussion? Yeah, and I and I guess, you know, like everybody's gonna wanna represent, whoever gets to be at that table is going to represent their own interests, but, but who's let in and what those interests are already like untold sort of uh, accepted, um, uh, lines and, and that's what's interesting so i guess w where does it come interesting for the network state is that um well it seems like one of the goals is that you get to redraw what those assumptions are and who gets to set that table my argument if i'm allowed to go on to like a sort of a sidebar but which is for me the most important actually discussion in this um that opens up with history so it does it, it does quite well actually is that um I don't see how this is a viable action plan for anyone unless your value um, is is not about culture, but really the the goal is that you want diplomatic uh, you want diplomatic recognition. That has to be the first goal of any network state beyond what else, whatever you know, whatever other values. and we'll we'll talk about this in in the in the points um in terms of like, oh, you know, a society is shaped by wanting to be good versus evil not supporting stealing versus something else but at the end of the day if you want to be a successful nation state that first phase of um or you want to be a successful uh, network state the first phase of that development of this uh alternative has to be can they challenge the definition of a nation state and that is such a high maybe lofty but very difficult goal that all of your energy will have to be dedicated to that if your net energy is we propose a better society that's going to detract from the argument that you can make as a as a um, um, as trying to get uh, when you're trying to get diplomatic reputation, I think. And and okay. we, 
uh, yeah, I mean, it, the culture of diplomacy for me would be the first community culture that you would have to go through. Um, if at least the very first network state. Once you once you've established that, then sure, different network states can have different values, just as different nation states today represent different values between China and America. But who is that first nation state that was able to say, look, this is the way we're going? Very important. They had to show they were the big boss in whatever was the system before. And and I think um, I think there's no way that's that's done without a little bit of a uh, bit of a shock, uh, totally. a little bit of extremism. Totally. And so I think, you know, what I was thinking of when you were talking about that is uh, this is also linked in the network state book. But, you know, what is self-determination in this context? Right. And so I'm just going to go through this paragraph here. Right. The right of a people to self-determination is a cardinal principle in modern international law, commonly regarded as Zhu Kogan's rule. I don't know. Binding as such on the United Nations as authoritative uh, or authoritative interpretation of the charter's norms. It states that peoples based on respect for the principle of equal rights and fair equality of opportunity have the right to freely choose their sovereignty and international political status with no interference. Um, and this concept was first expressed in the 1860s and it spread rapidly thereafter. So this is a fairly new concept um, in international law and it's essentially to paraphrase saying that if people, uh, based on our international respect for equal rights and equal opportunity, if people want to be sovereign and they want their political status to reflect that, they should be able to do that without interference. Um, and so this is an incredibly relevant conversation to be having right now with what's going on in Ukraine and Russia, right? Where uh, Ukraine has wanted its sovereignty forever, um, and they've always had to fight for it, and now they're quite literally in war fighting for it uh, because Russia did not want to recognize that. And so when uh, countries like Russia or China or the U.S. or uh, any colonial country in the past um, is abusing their power to remove the ability for a people to declare their sovereignty and political status, um, that is them countering this relatively new international moral code that we've put together uh, that should be theoretically enforced by the UN um, to basically protect people's rights to do that. Um, and so as long as a network state, if we are abiding by this political ideology today and moving forward, clearly states uh, that they want to be sovereign, uh, the UN should be protecting that. But where does that uh, back up? You know, like how does that get enforced? Um, what's the caveat when it's a group of people that's decentralized across the entire globe? Uh, you know, do they be, are they recognized in the cloud? <laughs> like, are they recognized physically? Are all their enclaves recognized independently in each of the different countries that they're based in? Like, these are all questions we have to ask ourselves. Um, but yeah, so I think that was like, that was like, you know, one of the most important points that you brought up here, which is why ultimately does it matter if people say they want to be sovereign? Well, it matters because if people don't have that right, then any country, because it's more powerful, has the right to dominate you, um, and to take whatever it wants. Um, and if we don't have that, then, you know, basically the world can go into complete chaos very quickly because it becomes a resource grab uh, as, as quickly as possible. Um, so, yeah, I think that that is a huge prerequisite to understand um, and to and to understand that it's a relatively recent idea. Um, and then back to this previous point that you were making about, you know, this consolidation of power and centralization. Uh, what I was thinking about with that is really uh, ancient. Right. So talking about the Chinese empire uh, and how that was able to grow so strong for so many years uh, because they were able to connect all of their nodes, uh, right? And so same with like the uh, Roman empire and the Greek empire, but sticking with the Roman, let's say, you know, they would conquer massive areas of land and set outposts. And those uh, outposts would be contested very frequently by the Gauls and um, other barbarian tribes. Um, 
But Rome, as a result of that, was able to focus on other things. And because of that, it had massive advancements in the cultural and artistic side uh, or the higher aspects of Maslow's hierarchy, right? So they had the safety, they had the shelter, they had the food, right? They had the water, um, they had the uh, belonging, right? All those like primary psychological needs. And then uh, these outposts were taking care of that for them so that the capital can focus on these higher rungs on Maslow's hierarchy. And that led to all these massive innovations in philosophy, art, you know, creativity, expression, all of these things. And that we have looked at, uh, no matter how far back, as um, very important, right? And a, a massive role that um, uh, societies, uh, or I guess empires have played. Now you contrast that with, for example, the Mongol empire, where Genghis Khan was able to conquer such massive parts of Asia very, very quickly, because they were a nomadic uh, war tribe that relied solely on horses for everything, right? So for meat, for milk, for transport. Um, the downside of that was, even though they were able to expand extremely quickly, their outposts sucked, right? Because they weren't good at agriculture. They weren't good at setting up those outposts to then stay and defend. And so what ended up happening is those Chinese uh, tribes or other tribes would um, take over when that empire was spread too thin, and that's why it didn't last so long. And so to tie this all together, centralization um, and empires were really good in the long run for humans to progress in the ways that we care about if we say that, you know, like we value Maslow's hierarchy. Um, but uh, without those empires, there isn't enough of a sense of safety um, where you know all those lower rung Maslow's hierarchy needs are taken care of so that people can focus on self-transcendence, self-reflection, all these other kinds of things, which is what produces the most amount of advancements in things like philosophy, right? Potentially technology, which is what is more relevant to us today, um, uh, to take care of all these other needs, right? Um, that people have elsewhere. So um, it's a really interesting uh point to focus on and, and think about like what are the benefits of this centralization and empires and what are the downsides of that and where are the lines where if everybody is doing self-determination you know what can they accomplish in the grand scheme compared to an empire where it is much more centralized but you don't have this self-determination and sovereignty everywhere and where do we draw that line and you know should every network state be able to do that is that um, is that something that we want to accelerate technological innovation on the whole for humanity? Or is it just like everybody should live in their own little enclaves and do their own thing? Um, you know, it kind of brings up the idea. One of the uh, conversations Balaji was talking about was with, you know, the U.S. in the early days post-World War II made a lot of efforts to um, bring every immigrant group together. Right. So everybody was referring to themselves as Polish American or Italian American or Irish American or whatever. Uh, but what that did is it created all these little enclaves and all these subgroups within, for example, New York City and a lot of racism. Right. And so it wasn't easy for those people to cooperate and focus on other things like, hey, like what can we accomplish if we all work together and we all bring our unique strengths together as opposed to. Um, focusing in on only the things that we like and we want to do, right? And so I think it was FDR or Franklin Delano Roosevelt who focused on, let's stop using that language and I want everyone to start referring to themselves as American, just American, right? And it puts everybody under the same umbrella. We're all on the same team. Therefore, we should all cooperate towards a greater goal. Um, and so that kind of brings in like language, right? Uh, history as well, like the histories of each of these individual countries and how that determines how they interact with other countries, um, even within a new country like America, right? So like, what is Italian history versus Polish history versus Irish history have to say about how we interact with each other? Um, and there's definitely a lot more to talk about with that. Um, like, for example, the, the war, uh, the Revolutionary War in Haiti, where Haiti fought back against uh, the French colonizers, um, and Poland was supposed to help them to conquer uh, Haiti and, and establish themselves, the French as a, as a, as a uh, 
powerful colony. Uh, but upon the Polish army arriving to Haiti and realizing that the Haitian history of oppression was very similar to their own history from Russian oppression, switched sides and decided, let's kick the French out um, because we understand and empathize and sympathize with your history. And so that now made Haiti an independent country. And that still lives to this day, where if you're a Haitian citizen, you can have a Polish passport uh, and vice versa. Or sorry, no, every Polish passport can have a Haitian uh, citizenship or passport, right? So these things um, matter a ton um, when it comes to how these lines of countries are, are shaped. Um, and so, yeah. Anyway, lots uh, to go off there. Raph, let's take a second to go through your thoughts. Um, yeah, I, I, firstly, thanks for that last bit. I actually didn't know that about um, Poland and uh, Haiti. Haiti, Haiti, yeah, Haiti. Um, yeah, I mean, it's probably, I, I like that we've gone through like <laughs> two paragraphs <laughs> of the of the chapter on history. So yeah. there's... Um, <laughs> There's still so much <laughs> that we have to cover that we'll probably be we'll hopefully be able to do in the next um in the next one, um. But I I mean for me the biggest point there that came out um and 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 sort of disregarding everything else that you said, um, is the idea that uh, what happens you know if you have conflicting um self determination um in one space and actually the way that I would see it being applied to the network state is well what in, in fact is a good transition with the with the Poland and um, Haiti but what would you like how does the network state regulate for people having multiple memberships basically to different member states like is it a one for all and how is it how what's the switching capacity because ultimately aside like again putting aside the concept of empires and the benefits and and how those are actually felt across the empire because you know well, part of an empire is sort of that there's there's kind of a group in power in an empire uh can those groups are those groups competing internally for power um and how much of that is uh available uh if, for example in a meritocratic way you know especially if uh, in other factors other than direct like political power there are shifting of scales of balances of whatever um putting that aside um uh, if the network state isn't able to solve this uh like uh mobility human mobility and then also social mobility issue then um or or like if it doesn't have a dramatic shift in the way that we can understand how people move around uh, how people are allowed to move around and how people are allowed to change sides accordingly and and given the opportunity to do that, then there's not that much difference and the concept of self-determination hasn't really been expanded, which I think was the whole point of, uh, I think that's what you were trying to get at with the, the opportunity that we have with Network State. Totally, totally. Okay, so um, I'm just going to throw in one more quote from uh, the uh, 2.1 uh, chapter here right, is that it's much easier to use an iPhone than to build Apple, than to build Apple Inc. And the reason I say this and why it's relevant is because the founders are going to determine what wins here, right? What has the most value? What is the most attractive to the most amount of people? So we kind of have to approach these like startups where why did the founding fathers set up that constitution? Why did they choose those values, right? Why did they instill these amendments? Um, why can I be a dual citizen of the US and France, right? And so each of these considerations come down to the founders coming together and deciding this is going to be the most attractive thing that we want to build, right? And so it's much easier to use an iPhone than to build Apple because the founders have a much harder job than the citizens of the network state. They need to figure out how is the whole system going to come together and attract everyone, right? And then how do we make it easy enough to use, right? What are all the features? What are all the benefits of this so that you as a citizen uh, bring value to our network state while also feeling free enough to do whatever you want, right? Because ultimately the winner is going to be 
which network state attracts either the most amount of people or the most amount of powerful people, right? Um, and so we can see this with China right now. China has the most amount of people, and that's incredibly powerful because they have an extremely centralized government with a lot of highly um, collective, aligned collective action, right, through communism uh, and a centralized government that basically gets to say, okay, this is what we're doing now, and we're leveraging all the technology however we want. So we're going to use WeChat for spending. We're going to use it for social network. We're going to use it for X, Y, Z, so that we, the government, get a sense of what our citizenship is doing at any given time. And that gives them enough data to then make informed decisions about we want to do X, Y, Z to accomplish X, Y, Z goals, right? Um, so yeah, I think it all comes down to, and, and we should explore this point, like let's say, um, and this will be, I think, the last point that we go over in this piece. We'll go over why history is so crucial in another episode. Um, but if we're the founders of a new country, what are the considerations that we're bringing to the table? Um, why? And what will ultimately determine what we settle on? So I can throw out a couple of things and, and let me know what you think, right? Um, when you start a startup, you want to think about the vision first, right? And vision is defined as what do you ultimately want to accomplish with this idea, right? What's the massive, big picture impact that you're trying to have, right? Then you want to go into mission, which is how you're going to get that vision accomplished. And lastly, values, right? So what makes you unique in terms of your values to attract the right people or stand by certain values so that you know when there's controversy, you're not being uh, judged based off anything but those or you're sticking to those values or whatever it is, right? Um, and then you know if we add this, this uh, state piece to it, um, like the founding fathers with the constitution, right? What is the, the rule book, right? What are the guidelines and the rule book that ultimately determine what's enforced, what's not enforced, um, based on those mission, vision, and values. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, so if I understand correctly, it's ideally here with the network state, we're reopening up the idea that you could um, find different visions for different, um, for what we would still define as what is a country basically, or or more in the like broad sense of what is a country's or slash one society, one state kind of thing. Yeah. Like what is it about um, one over the other? Like for example, what I can see happening is uh, similarly to DAOs, um, people coming together and saying, we really care about the ocean cleanup uh, in the Pacific Northwest, okay? And Amen. that's what we're focusing on. That's our main vision. We envision a world in which the Pacific Northwest ocean uh, or that area is completely clean of trash. And our mission is we're going to crowdfund a bunch of money. We're gonna use the most cutting edge uh, ocean cleanup technology. And we care about environmentalism, we care about ocean life, we care about um, uh, sustainability, right? Whatever their values are. And that's us. If you want to join, here's the call to action, right? Here's our website. Here's the wallet that you can connect, whatever it is. Um, here are the membership fees, if they're membership fees. And, um, you know, here's how you set up a proposal. Here's how you vote on our proposal. Here's how we decide on what gets acted on. And that's it. And so all of these types of things will then pop up based on those founders coming up with a cause that they really care about, right? A vision that's inspiring enough to get other people to care about it. And then a mission that makes sense for them to actually back it, either financially or with their effort or whatever. And then the values to keep it all together when things get turbulent, right? So when they are challenged or when somebody needs to get fired from the organization, or if the organization is under attack, what do we fall back on to say, no, this is who we are and this is what we're sticking to. Um, mm -hmm. And then lastly, right, what's the guidebook that enforces those values? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting because I guess just on that, the 
what the U.S. does really well differently than most other states um, who are still defined in the same way as a nation state acting in the space is the fact that the thing that they fall back to and the guidebook are one and the same. The Constitution plays a sim uh, plays for the whole society as the symbol. Right. Uh, which is kind of interesting. So I don't know where that symbol is or comes from uh, in, in a network state. Um, I mean, the idea that you would want to come up with vision, mission, values, uh, rule book, ultimately a symbol for a network state. I still think the only, I, I, I mean, I don't know, maybe I'm harp harping on a question, which, well, well I, I know I'm excited to see this one come out when we go further in the, um, in the chapters, because practically it's, uh, so there's so many points, but, um, so exciting, but, um, <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> The idea this is the kind of stuff that we like to talk about at the lunch table you know when you're in high school and you're like yeah man what if we make an island nation with only people who are artists and it's that's not gonna go yeah. well you're yeah, exactly you're this, I actually uh, i remember having these conversations with you and with um our mutual friend tom uh back in uh saint andrews where we were like okay well if we wanted to make our own island and it was a completely sustainable and you know it was running on itself and it had these values and whatever and that's when like this concept came up, you know, way before um, the network state was even mentioned, right? It was more for these other forms of forming a country, like what seasteading was, where you just live on a cruise ship or like colonizing space, um, mm -hmm. right? Like this whole, at the time we were thinking, well, you know, if you need to make a new country, you would need um, either an enclave, but that would have the all, all the differences of, or the complications of, you know, being um, within a country and therefore having to abide by those rules. So we thought, well, where are the gray areas? It's in international waters. So we'd have to make our own island in an international water, right? And that'd be man-made because the other, all the other ones have been claimed uh, and declare that as the country. Um, and it's such a funny way to have gone about it because we didn't even think, uh, what if we could just make it decentralized and on the cloud? Why do we need this real estate in this contested gray area? Um, and that's again, back to history. Like we didn't have a different way of thinking about it. And so that informed our thinking and didn't uh, prompt us to think from first principles about like what, what is needed to make a country in the first place. And if we're going by biology's definition, right? It's a set population, uh, annual income, a uh, real world assets that's on a, some kind of ledger or census or something that's verifiable and diplomatic recognition, that's it. Um, so when you put it down to those four things, it's like, wow, a lot of things can make a country pretty easily um, as long as they attract enough people and enough assets, enough value. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think I'll, I'll close with just this point, which I, uh, I said in the beginning, but um, I think whatever your vision, mission, values, system um, you put in place or you would want as a country to prove that the network state is viable, I think your first value, your first mission is everything. All of our energies should be directed to getting a diplomatic, um, a diplomatic recognition, basically. Like I, I think the first network state that would, you know, assuming this is something someone will try at some point, <laughs> maybe us. Yeah, so, so um, that's another thing that we should bring up and share actually, uh, but yeah, go ahead, I'll pull it up. Yeah, it's just that it's um. If you're not going to, I don't know. This is my this is my premise. I guess it's my theory is, you you want to put this forward, you have to get it. Um, all of your energy should be dedicated to having the other players um have to notice you, uh, and if um and and I'm very curious to see like, that's why I'm excited about the next you know as we get further and further into this book, um like what are the steps. Uh, that he recommends to get there because I I just don't see how the network state um, it, it basically whatever their vision will have to choose will have to be will have to encapsulate getting diplomatic recognition as one of the primary um, pillars and then whatever else you motive you like sort of are able to sell people on 
um, because maybe they're the challenge is that diplomatic reputation isn't actually that motivating for most people, <laughs> especially not yeah. on a day to day so, basis. Yeah. Um, then, then where, you know, where does that put you? Um, cause not you, you just, you don't want to come into a space where everybody's sort of just cr trying to craft their own utopia idealism because, you know, after that, after a while, then you're, you're not really, um, you're just, I think you would just end up being, uh, wasting a lot of energy basically. Totally. And, and not, and not achieving so much. So this is the, the network state dashboard. Um, and this is live showing how many network state projects have started. Um, and it's specifically in this case, startup societies, there are 26, um, since this started on the website that Bology is looking at, right. And probably helping and investing in some. So let, let, let's just see, right here you can see, and it's actually really interesting that one of the tabs is literally mission, right. Or one of the columns is mission. And that's because that is the main driving force to attract people that's currently happening right now. Right. So there's an application, right. There's the name here. We can see mission building a pan-African digital nation, uh, bow tie jungle, synonymous community, anti-bank pro crypto, right? That's like the bankless community, building a protocol for startup cities, uh, building a decentralized city for creators, right? So all of these projects are happening right now. Um, and this list is probably growing every single day. Um, and so if we can start thinking about them as these startup societies that have this mission, and that's why it's so core because, and, and that's why, you know, this main differentiating factor between a startup and a startup society is culture because culture, uh, all it really means is, do we have people that are mission focused first, right? Do they care more about the mission than they care about their own needs? Because if they do, then it's highly aligned collective action. If they don't, then it's splintered action where it's like, well, what, you know, how does this maximize my position or what do I get out of this the most? Right. Um, so anyway, let's, let's take a look at one as an example. So this is Afropolitan. All right. So this is the link to their website. It looks like, um, so I'm assuming, you know, that's what it's going to start off with just like any startup, right? Homepage. What are we sharing on the homepage? Okay. So they have a citizen pass assuming that's probably something like an NFT, right? Which de determines, okay, if you have the NFT, you are a citizen. If you don't have the NFT, you're not a citizen. Um, we can look into that. Um, and here we go, right? So they're building an email list, right? They've got a manifesto, which is basically like their uh, declaration of independence, right? Join us. Here are the founders, right? There are some stories, so some testimonials of sorts from members. Social proof, look at that. And another call to action to join and some social communities, right? So this is very, very similar to a startup right now. The only it difference looks, it looks exactly like a startup, which is it's it's kind of fun. Yeah. Right, right. They're really they're copying the startup model as much as possible, yeah. but they're adding they a podcast. Yeah. They're adding this focus on specifically uh making uh or building, sorry, a pan-African digital nation. That's yeah. all. I mean that's all it is yeah. to start. To be honest, of all of the the titles that I like, all the missions that I'm seeing, that one. I, the thing is that mission exists outside of. Um, that's a movement that exists outside of uh, just the network state uh, concept, and um, it's really. It, that one actually does seem like something that fits within that parameter of you know yeah a lot of that information is going to have to be or sorry a lot of that energy is going to have to be channeled in getting like a diplomatic uh, recognition. Um, if, if you want it to be successful. And I think if you don't have that as a core pillar of your mission at that scale, you know, like where you are being invited to the United Nations, <laughs> like for me, that would be, if I'm imagining the story of a network state becoming something legitimate in a peaceful way, it's that they get invited to the, uh, to the United Nations. Um, whatever you think about what the United Nations is supposed to mean, it's, a, it will be, it's, it's a form of legitimacy.
exactly. Um, it's just, um, it's just legitimacy, right? It's like a seat at the table. So this is interesting. We're just like going through, right? They're creating, yeah, these unique identifiers that are also art. So basically, right? Like I said, NFT, where the passport is, you know, also artistic, uh, which is kind of interesting. Because if you look at traditional passports uh, and you flip through some of them, they actually have very interesting things that they include in the passport. So I encourage anyone who's like listening, check out your passport, look through the pages, read what's in there. Look at the branding that they're using. Look at the imagery that they're using. It's all kind of some form of subtle propaganda, um, but it's also this reminder that you are a citizen of this country and this country believes in X, Y, Z. And you are a member of that. Um, mm -hmm. So it's actually like, yeah, kind of breaking down. I mean, I think looking at the passports that have done it best is a good baseline. And then look at the DAOs that have done it best and use that for the tech enablement side. And that's a pretty easy template to follow for your network state. Um, so anyway, so that's one. Um, and it's it's very exciting to see that there's you know so many uh, and that they're happening like pretty quickly because this is all again, so recent. Um, but, and these are just the ones that are, you know, listed on Bology's website right now. Um, so that's 26 that we know exist that Bology's paying attention to. Um, there's probably way more. Um, now, what I'm curious about is these, like, what does an application look like? You know, is this just like a type form? <laughs> you know, uh, it is a type form. Look at that. <laughs> wow. Um, so yeah, it's basically just like a quick form, I'm assuming to say, but you know, what do you care about? Why, what do you bring to the table? And like, why should you be excited? And these are the hiring policies, right? So like, how do you get a green card? How do you get a U.S. passport? Um, what do you care about? Do you need to know the, the history, right? Like, so I think like the U.S. as an example here is, is funny because um, they're focused on, you know, their citizens being able to take this test. That's basically just like, do you know, the names of certain presidents? Do you know the dates of when certain important events happened? Um, and I don't care about that. You know, what I care about but is this... like the values, but it's like, it's basically just them showing, you know, have you cared enough about joining this thing that you've put in the time and effort to learn this history of ours? And do you care enough about this history of ours um, to spend that time to apply? Uh, and I think that's what we're going to see more of. So it's not necessarily going to be, you know, tell us when this date happened, but kind of just like for companies, maybe an essay question of, uh, you know, why should you uh, be allowed to join the network state? And another essay question of, you know, here's one of the massive issues that we're undergoing right now. How would you handle it? Right. Um, and then that determining, okay, so not only are you putting in enough effort because you want to be a part of this because you care about it enough? Um, but you're also evincing your value that you're bringing to the table through an application, right? Um, that isn't immediate clear in traditional countries. I mean, yeah, they're looking at your your numbers and stuff as well. Like, you know, are you an entrepreneur? Are you bringing uh, real world asset, assets here? Are you going to buy real estate here? Are you going to develop businesses here? How are you adding value to the country? Um, so yeah, let's just go like flip through this and. Uh, Raf, if you have any other questions or comments as I go through. Um, yeah, I mean, it's along the spectrum that we we, we mentioned in the beginning. This is, uh, this is still, I guess, what they're considering a startup society. So we're far from what, uh, including all of the um, components that other make steps, up the network yeah. state. Right. So yeah, it's interesting to see how these things will evolve, but um, it's got to start it's really, here. It, sure. I mean, yeah, it, it's it, right now they're building a, they're building startup projects. They're building little DAOs. Um, uh, with value, I I would say just that the um, <laughs> the funniest bit is that um, you would want it, this form doesn't have any history questions perhaps <laughs> or no. or your form your form that you mentioned <laughs> has no history um, right but the theme of this is um history as a trajectory which is um i wonder how I, much I, that I think that, the foundation of a startup nation to begin with but yeah exactly right it's like you know 
do the founders need to know? Uh, yes. Do the users need to know? Do the citizens need to know? Not necessarily. And that's where that split happens. Like, But maybe um, I, what'd be really fun is uh, in the next episode, just throwing this live is that we actually go through an entire application for one of these and sort of follow it up. And maybe one of the series that we could do you know, listeners, let us know in the comments if you find this really interesting. But let's let's see if we can join at a, one of these startup nations, uh, or maybe eventually do our, our own. And maybe there could be um could be just this side um side series where we're just uh, yeah yeah we're gonna, I think we're that's gonna a, try I think, to take this project live. <laughs> I, I think we can definitely dive into that more. But just going, you know, skimming through here, it seems very much like a mix between a. Uh, startup application and a country or qualifying sales call type form where it's like, what are your skill sets? How do you identify? So it's kind of getting both sides. Like, how should we target you as a user and how do we sell to you better? And also, um, what are you bringing to the table here? Right. So it's playing both sides, um, which I think is, um, is very interesting because it's like, because they're so new and nascent and not that powerful right now, they have to balance that beam, right? Of um, you're new and we want to grow this as much as possible. Uh, so we want to take as many people as possible. Uh, and then the other side of, we also only want people that are going to be helpful and valuable to this cause. Um, and so we need to be selective. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's very typical of DAOs today, but uh... Uh, because they need to they need to grow from inside um great well that was uh <laughs> that was a rabbit hole man <laughs> yeah that was, uh... i think we've jumped we jumped around quite a bit um for all of our listeners uh like you comment expect more subscribe. of this <laughs> yeah <laughs> share uh rate the podcast don't forget sign up for our newsletter at the network smash State. that like button <laughs> destroy that like button <laughs> Um, NetworkStatePodcast.com um, on our news. Please come, come and find us in, in real life. Also, we'll be walking around uh, whatever our geolocality might be if you have any questions. Yeah, I, I actually broadcast my live location at all times. I think that's a really smart idea. <laughs> I, I think I think it's part of uh, building our, that might be one of our values of our network state, Adrian. <laughs> yeah, actually, everybody but, knows where everybody is at all times. Um, mm -hmm. It's not we're one big family anyway. account. Yeah, yeah, promise, promise. No big brother stuff here. Um, but anyway, join the newsletter, get our exclusive perks, like our member community, deals on merch, and early access to some surprises. We'll catch you in the next one. Till then, have a good one. Thanks for listening. In the next episode, we'll cover how history is crucial and why it matters. We'll talk about how history is how you win the argument, how history determines legality, how history determines morality, how history is how you develop compelling media, how history is the true value of cryptocurrency, and how history tells you who's in charge.